Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 14, Interactions Between Atoms and Molecules. See if it's pointed there. A little low. Today we begin the second half of the book, our discussion of interacting systems. We're first going to treat interacting particle systems in which we're looking at equilibrium properties, and then we'll push on for the last quarter of the discussion to treat interacting systems and G dynamics. So where we begin is so far what we have done is to discuss systems in which the energy is separable. That is the kinetic energy of all the gas atoms in this room can be written as the sum of the kinetic energy of the first gas atom, the kinetic energy of the second gas atom, and so forth. And the kinetic energy of each gas atom doesn't care what the kinetic energy of any of the other gas atoms is. The one exception to that so far has been our discussion of solids. But our, in our discussion of solids, that was something of an illusion. That is, we said a crystalline solid is a bunch of masses the masses are connected by springs, and therefore each mass interacts with all of its neighbors, and the neighbors interact with their neighbors, and so forth. However, if the springs are simple Hooke's Law springs, the potential energy is harmonic, and in that case, we can come up with a set of collective coordinates, normal modes, and we can write the energy in terms of the amplitude of each normal mode. Furthermore, no matter how big or small the crystal is, we can do that normal mode decomposition as long as the springs are harmonic. Mm -hmm. And we can obtain a set of collective coordinates, and the energy is separable in terms of the collective coordinates. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Um, we did discuss one system in which the energy had an external term, namely we talked about the gas in this room if we inserted the potential energy due to gravity. And the potential energy due to gravity is mg z sub i, mm -hmm. where z sub i is the altitude of atom i in the room. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine too, but once again this is a separable energy. We're now going to proceed to talk about systems in which the energy does not separate. That is, systems such as liquids in which, so far as we know, there are no true collective coordinates. Um, now I have to put two qualifications on that. First of all, that's a so far as we know. Mm -hmm. And I can't guarantee that some sufficiently clever person someday isn't going to find a set of collective coordinates, though I would be somewhat surprised. Second, it may be the case that even if there aren't true collective coordinates, there are approximate collective coordinates which, in some sense, simplify matters. Uh, certainly it's the case if you have a liquid um, it does have sound waves just like a solid does. You can store energy in the sound waves and some of the specific heat of the uh, liquid can be assigned to the energy stored to those sound waves. So it, it, the situation isn't quite trivial but for practical constraints you have at potential energy interactions and they, you now have a system in which you cannot do the separation. So the question is, what do you do next? Well, the first thing you have to do is to talk a bit about the potential energy. And we start with equation 
on page 226. And equation 15.2 looks somewhat innocent. What it says is that the potential energy can be written as a sum of terms. Each term involves two particles in the system. We call the potential V subscript IJ. And so we say we're going to write the energy as a sum of pair potentials. Now if I told you you had charges and you wrote the total Coulomb energy, that's exactly what you'd write. In fact, that's the next equation, equation 15.3. Uh, there is a convention as to how you count V subscript 1, 2 and V subscript 2, 1. That is, the sum over I and J goes over all of the potential energy terms, but in a certain sense it goes over them twice, and depending on how you've defined the potential energy, you may have to correct for the double counting. Nonetheless, there's the Coulomb potential energy equation 15.3, and equation 15.3 makes the pair potential look entirely natural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one half is out there to account for the doubling of the... Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's only one problem with this. If you look at real material systems, and the simplest system you can get in practical terms is liquid argon. Even for liquid argon, equation 15.2 is wrong. The reason equation 15.2 is wrong is that if you have a, an atomic or molecular system, this would not come up in a plasma if everything is totally ionized. Uh, you have what are called three-body and four-body potentials. That is, there is a part of the potential energy between the atoms which cannot be written as a sum of two-body terms. Uh, in the most optimistic case, which is liquid argon, the um, two-body terms account for, the three-body terms, I mean, account for about 10% of the total potential energy in terms they make a 10% contribution to the um, Helmholtz free energy in the thermodynamic properties. Uh, on the dynamic properties like viscosity, the three body terms make something more like a 40% contribution. And this is for liquid argon, which is about as well behaved as you could get. Argon has fairly hard atomic orbitals, so if you put some, so the electron shells don't distort much, and therefore you have some, the three body terms are minimized. Well, you might ask, why do you have three body terms? Well, here is an atom, and the electrons give it a fluctuating dipole moment. And if there is another atom here, it also has a fluctuating dipole moment. And energetically, the fluctuating dipoles are more likely to be oriented when they attract and they repel. And this creates a force between nearby atoms, an attractive force, that's the van der Waals energy. Well, that's very nice, but if there's, I don't have three hands. On the third hand, if there is a third atom up here, the third dipole reorients or makes it more likely that the dipoles are like this than like this. And as a result, because the third body is here, there is this extra term that depends on the relative position of all three atoms. Well, argon has weak fluctuating dipoles. If you go out to um, xenon, or if you go out to radon, which people generally don't do because it's highly radioactive and hard to keep at a constant temperature, but certainly xenon, the electron clouds in the xenon are relatively soft, and therefore the three body terms are larger. Now you might say, oh, well, let's go to neon or helium. And the problem even with neon is that there are quantum corrections to the behavior of the system. They aren't as dramatic as in helium, where you have superfluidity in helium-4 because the wave functions overlap and you have to satisfy the statement that helium-4 is a boson. Um, however, 
even for neon there are significant quantum corrections and going to neon doesn't help. Nonetheless, we talk about liquids with pair interactions because it is an appropriate way to develop the general theory and we hope that once we've done this we can add the refinements needed to discuss real molecules. Refinements such as three atom potentials. Uh, refinements such as the issue that there are not very many spherical molecules. Most molecules have a shape and as a result the potential energy of interaction of these two molecules whether they're doing this or this depends on their orientation so for each atom you have an extra three orientation variables well we won't do the orientation variable part um, we could go on down the list um, we are going to talk about what are called simple fluids a simple fluid is a somewhat hypothetical material, though we treat argon as an approximation, in which the potential is a pair potential. The underlying mechanics is entirely classical, so we can ignore quantum corrections. Um, the molecules are spheres, so we don't have orientation. And then we ask, well, what can we compare, what can we look at that behaves like a quantum a um, classical simple fluid. Argon, zeon, xenon, um, radon in principle, neon not so much. Some people will drop in some molecular materials. Uh, methane is actually quite close to being a sphere. Um, some people will put in, oh, let's see, krypton I forgot. Then, of course, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they're not really quite spherical. A molecule that people tend to forget about that is a sphere is hydrogen chloride. Now, you might say, gee, there's a hydrogen, there's a chlorine, why isn't it a sphere? And the answer is, the proton in the hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen buries itself well within the electron cloud of the chlorine. So if we plot the electron cloud of the chlorine and we plot, plot it at a distance where another HCl molecule, if it tries to approach, gets something like a few kT of repulsion, we see a sphere. You can't see the proton. The molecule has a dipole moment, which means there's some calculational issues, but it's a sphere. How can we tell it's a sphere? We take hydrogen chloride and we dissolve it in liquid argon and we look at the infrared spectra. The infrared spectra correspond to the rotational energy levels. The ro lowest rotational le energy levels, the lowest half dozen of them in HCl, are the same in solution as they are in the dilute gas. They're not perfectly the same, they're broadened but it, they're very distinctly there because, in fact, the molecule is a sphere. Now, there's one other way you can get a sphere, which is not discussed in usual stat mech texts, and that is to take anything you want and heat it up to millions of degrees centigrade. Now, I can't imagine why anyone would want to do this. However, you can heat it up to millions of degrees centigrade, once you've heated it, it ionizes completely, and now you have atomic nuclei, which are spheres, or atomic nuclei with a few electrons on them, and those are pretty close to spheres, and you have electrons. Electrons are true point particles. They're not spheres, but they're points. The dominant potential is the um, Coulomb potential, uh, and that is, is a, in a sense, something like this. Um, there is a less painful way to get a cloud of ions, and that is to take table salt and to pour it into your drinking coffee. Not too much. You might not like the taste. Well, some people have funny tastes. They don't like salted coffee. Um, uh, having said this, um, the, uh, the mo electrons look around, and the sodium and the chloride disassociate. You have sodium ions and chlorine ions, chloride, dissolved, and you now have an electrolyte solution. 
Electrolyte solutions are sort of like dilute gases if they're not too concentrated. But the long-range electrostatic interaction leads to serious complications which we don't get to. So that's what simple fluids are. Now having said we're going to do a simple fluid which is slightly an extrapolation of what you can really get in nature. You might ask what potential energies do we use? Uh, the simplest answer is the hard sphere. The hard sphere pot potential energy is we have a sphere of radius A, we have another sphere of radius A, and the potential energy is zero until the two spheres come into contact at two A, and if you try to move them closer together, the potential energy is plus infinity. The spheres do not interpenetrate. That is the simplest possible system, potential energy. Now the advantage of this is that it's really simple to handle analytically. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that very clearly a hard sphere fluid cannot form a liquid gas layer. Why? Because the liquid side, there'd be nothing attracting the liquid atoms in to keep support a free surface between a liquid and a gas. Having said this, most statistical mechanicians are firmly convinced that the hard sphere system has a phase transition. And that if you run up the concentration of hard spheres at a volume fraction of about half, half the volume is the hard spheres, you start forming a second denser phase. And there will be two coexisting phases, a less dense phase and a more dense phase. And you then get up to the dense phase at about a concentration of 56%. In between, you have coexistence. Above 56%, you have a dense packed fluid. And if you keep increasing the concentration, you, um, well, you'd say, do things keep going on? Well, no, not indefinitely. There are two limits. The obvious limit is that at some point, the spheres are close packed. When I started teaching this course many years ago, I had to warn people with the statement, the densest you could get was about 72% by volume corresponding to close packed hard spheres. But there, the mathematical upper limit was higher than this because no one had at that time been able to prove that there was not an ordered system whose density was higher than the obvious close packed hard spheres. It sort of looked like no one could find a way of doing it, but the mathematical proof was not there. And only very recently, within my lifetime, um, after the introduction of paper, actually, um, it, um, the, um, was it shown that the hard-packed spheres are, in fact, the upper density limit for packing spheres. The problem was, for example, trying to prove there is no way to take a sphere and pack around it in some peculiar way 13 other spheres rather than 12 so that all 13 spheres are in contact with the sphere in the middle. And it's sort of these, it looks obvious, but it's a little hard to do as a proof. In between, however, the 56% and the 72%, there's something else that happens around uh, two-thirds by volume or a bit less. Namely, if you try to construct a system that is um, has a density between oh, 66 and 72 percent, and you do it either by trying to insert spheres or something or other, you discover it's very hard to generate. It's very it, it's the traditional question. Suppose I have a big cloth bag full of glass marbles. If I've just dumped the marbles in, or flour, or sugar, or salt, and I shake things, for a while I shake and the level settles. This is why your cereal box is empty at the top. It's settled. However, if I wait a bit, I can shake and settle, but after a while, if I keep shaking,
the level stops moving. And the level stops moving at something a bit under two-thirds by volume. It's very hard to persuade it to pack better. So that's hard spheres. There is an interesting computer problem. The assertion that there is a phase separation in the hard sphere system was done a very long time ago on a computer um, that might be able to power a, um, oh, a microwave oven, but you wouldn't want to try to run your car. And it was a supercomputer in the period. And a modern study on the same question, looking carefully at what happens at the, um, on a big system, what happens in this transition region, might actually be interesting, or at least show things that don't seem to have been looked at very hard. Uh, let's consider some other potentials. An obvious alternative potential energy is the Gaussian, e to the minus r squared over r zero squared. That's 15.6. Now, I mentioned the nice feature of this is that its spatial Fourier transform behaves well. This is useful for certain things. It's analytically smooth. It actually cuts off quite hard before you go very far. It is finite in the middle. Uh, however, as a practical matter, uh, if finite is 1,000 kT, the fact that it's only finite rather than infinity really doesn't affect the situation because you are talking about states that are, require so much energy they never happen. And it has a cutoff. Um, another very important alternative is a potential variously known as the Debye potential or the Yukawa potential or the screened electrostatic potential. That's e to the minus kappa r over r. Um, this is a potential you get in a plasma cloud, um, though the screening length, or in a metal, the screening length may be quite long. Okay, other potentials, 15.8, the 612 potential. The 612 potential is a halfway, it's known as the Leonard Jones potential. The, virtue of the virtues of the Lenard jones potential are as follows. It has a very hot, large repulsive core. It's not a hard sphere. It has a slope. And that means there are various integrals you can do, and the integrals are all well behaved. But it has a hard, quite hard core, because it does go off to infinity. The r to the 6 term with the other sign means the potential energy comes down and goes negative and then goes back to zero at large distances. Why do we care about the goes negative part? Well, that says at some moderate distances, the atoms attract each other. And all atoms do it. Almost all atoms, I'll put in the exception in a second, do attract each other at some distances, and therefore almost all atoms are expected to have a liquid phase. Now I come to the two sorts of exceptions. The first exception is spin polarized atomic hydrogen. Spin polarized atomic hydrogen, at least when I, the last discussion I read of this, which was a while ago, the potential energy is repulsive at all distances. And the three-body potential does not help you. And therefore, it would appear that spin-polarized atomic hydrogen, since the atoms never attract, does not have a liquid state. Now we come to the other exception of a sort. And again, I am relying on people I believe to be experts. Carbon. Carbon has low and intermediate temperature stable forms, diamond and graphite. But if you heat carbon up enough, it turns into a gas. And it appears there's no indication that carbon has a liquid state. The implication of this is that the carbon-carbon potential um, 
either is repulsive at all distances or under any condition under which you could get a liquid, you first form graphite, which after all is stable to very high temperatures. So that is the 612 potential. There are criticisms of the 612 potential that it is actually not a very realistic representation of, say, the potential energy of argon, which is very, where, which, where it is very usually used. The reason this is significant is that you might like to do calculations using the real potential energy, and this one isn't it. Having said that, um, that you have that restriction. Um, you can also say, though, um, it does give reasonable answers, so there must be some fortuitous cancellations. Let us return to, okay, so that's the 612 potential, which is sort of, the 612 potential actually also gives you integrals that you can do. That is, if you are presented with the 612 potential and you want to calculate um, the partition function, the 612 potential is relatively cooperative. That's very positive. Okay, let us come back to the plasma and let me just explain a bit about the, how the plasma works. The plasma is based on Gauss's law. So, here we have a positive ion. And if you apply Gauss's law, area is 4 pi r square, charge inside is plus q, and therefore the electric field at the surface goes down as q over 4 pi r squared. Or as some of my undergraduates will tell me, 4 thirds pi r cubed, if you're a little unclear on the distance between volume and the surface area of a sphere. Uh, uh, well, most of them do very well on that, actually. However, having said this, um, suppose we have, we're in a plasma, so there are positive and negative ions around. This is positive, so states that put, here's a negative ion, the negative ions close to the positive ion are more favorable than states that put another positive ion close to the negative ion. And therefore, this positive ion tends to have nearby it negative ions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's apply Gauss's law to this. I will apply Gauss's law, and if I apply Gauss's law, it's the same surface area as before, but now inside here, in addition to the positive ion, there will be more other negative ions than there will be positive ions. There will be some positive ions close in, but there will be more negative ions. And therefore, if I apply Gauss's law, the net charge in here is smaller than it was originally because the minus ions are selectively lying close to the positive ion. And by the way, vice versa is also true. And therefore, the potential energy falls off faster than 1 over r. It falls off faster than 1 over r because as we move out from the positive ion, there are more and more negative, extra negative ions being included close in. This phenomenon is called screening. Okay. In order to have screening, there are two things you need to do. First, you have to have, in order to do orthodox screening, you might think, wouldn't this work even if the potential energy was relatively short range? And that would be an interesting stat mech problem, which I've never seen calculated out. But the answer is, if the potential energy is 1 over r, it's very clear. However, in order to have screening, you must have something else. You must have electroneutrality. There must, in net, be as many positive as there are negative ions in solution in order to get orthodox screening. If the system is not electroneutral, um, you get think screening effects, maybe, but you don't get screening. As an extreme case, suppose you had a system that only included one sign of charge. 
In that case, there can be no screening. There isn't any. Uh, and you might sensibly ask, gee, have I ever heard of a case of a long-range force in which there's only one sign of charge? Gravity, yes. All gra material has, has the same sign by convention positive for its gravitational charge. There are only positive gravitational charges, and therefore there is no such thing as screening in gravity. This is important to remember because there are a few other long-range forces in nature. For example, the hydrodynamic interaction as um, described by the Ocene tensor. We'll actually get to that at the end of the course. And the important issue there is there are people who say, well, hydrodynamic interactions have to be screened because they're long range. And the response to that is, Dom is a falling rock. That argument is completely wrong. There's no hydrodynamic equivalent of screening in a solution. Mm -hmm. There is in a gel or a sand bed, and there you do get screening. Okay, so we have now discussed screening. You can actually um, do calculations of how gravitational systems work. And the calculations are due to Kandrup and Hill, and the same two people then after a piece become Kandrup and Kandrup. And the calculation shows that a purely gravitational system does not go to thermal equilibrium. Instead, what happens is that a certain fraction of the stars, this is what you usually think of as point particles for gravity, form clusters that are denser and denser, and a certain other fraction of the particles are ejected with higher and higher kinetic energies on the way out, and the kinetic energy distribution becomes very, very strange, because there are particles in clusters that have what you'd expect from the very old theorem. And there are particles that have been ejected, and the high energy tail becomes bigger and bigger. Also, if you have, say, the gas in this room, and the density is close to uniform, and say there's a sound wave, so there's a little density wave like this, the sound wave damps out because of gas friction, viscosity. If you do the same thing in a gravitational system, the natural response of the gravitational system is for the fluctuations to grow and become bigger and bigger along all axes. And eventually you find aggregates of point particles, you know, galaxies, perhaps, mm -hmm. clusters, bubbles. There's some question of what the structure is. Well, having said this, that's long range potential. And I very briefly display. The tel axelrod teller, this is teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, same teller. This is the three-body axelrod teller potential. Um, the axelrod teller potential comes out of a very good, very solid quantum calculation. The strong point of it is that it really comes out of the calculation quite accurately. The disadvantage is that if you look at that, it's, there are three distances from particle 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. The potential energy is inversely as the cube of all three of these. The potential is obtained asymptotically at large interparticle distances. And therefore, the potential, since it's asymptotic, is most accurate when it's weakest. So you should realize. It's an example, but the limitations on, remember, this was done in paper and pencil once upon a time. Uh, the limitations on cranking out the calculation are such that it is hard to get more accurate, that it is not perfectly satisfactory at the, the distances at which it would be most interesting, namely the short distances. It's still a wonderful calculation. Okay. Section 15.2, we're actually going to do some partition functions, and we are going to do them for interacting particles.
So 15.10 is just the straight par uh, partition function Q for capital N interacting particles. There is nothing new there. There is a 1 over N factorial H3N. Since we have done the Kirkwood-Wigner theorem, you saw where that came from. The energy in Cartesian coordinates then has, as seen in 15.11, two sets of terms. There are the potential energy terms, which you have seen many times before, mm. and there are the, excuse me, there are kinetic terms, which you've seen many times before, and then the new potential energy terms. Well, the system isn't separable, but you can separate out all of the kinetic energy terms because they only depend on p. Mm -hmm. uh, let me insert a qualification here. Suppose you had a system in which magnetism was important. If magnetism is important, the canonical momentum of a charged particle is the usual mv p minus charge times potential a over c and p minus e over c, e a over c, the a depends on position. And you notice we have a demonstration which is more fundamental, the vector potential or the magnetic field, and the vector potential is considerably, A is considerably more fundamental than B, because it enters into the momentum. So if you actually ever are dealing with a magnetic system, you should realize there's a technical issue here that you have to be aware of. And I don't recall ever seeing that one discussed in more detail, though I'm sure it's out there someplace. Well, having said that, that we can split off all of the p square over 2m terms. Each of them is an integral dp e to the minus beta p square over 2m. And therefore, we can do all of those integrals separately. And each integral separately gives us something like 15.12. It gives us Actually, the integral gives us 1 over that capital lambda. It gives us a 1 over h and a 2 pi m k t square root in the numerator. But by convention, that's written as lambda. Lambda is called the thermal wavelength. It's a name. There is no wave. In a certain sense, there isn't exactly a thermal, but, though, but we are at a fixed temperature. If you put 1512 into 1510, that is, you do the integrals in 1510 and then you use 1512 as notation, you get 1513. And you now have an integral over the position of all of the particles e to the minus beta total potential energy. Uh, the integral drn is, a th is a th an n dimensional volume integral. There are n volume integrals in there, and therefore it has dimensions length to the 3n. Well, the thermal wavelength and the denominator is also length to the 3n, and those two cancel. So the dimensions of the integral are still unity as you would have desired. Okay, we now introduce yet another bit of notation. Look at 15.13, the right side. There is a 1 over lambda 3n n factorial, which for a while doesn't do very much. And then there is the integral itself. And we give the integral a name. We call the integral the configuration integral. And the configuration integral is the integral over positions of e to the minus beta potential energy. The configuration energy integral and the, and the partition function are related as seen as 15.15. So far, so good. Now we worry about something that many people don't. I mean, we've defined an integral configuration integral z, and we might worry if the integral converges or not. I mean, it's very nice to write an integral, but if the integral is divergent, you can use it to prove anything you want. Okay, so we consider a specific case. Suppose the potential energy has a lower bound. 
the potential energy is never further from plus infinity than some amount. And that lower bound is A. A could be negative if you want, but it's always less negative than minus infinity. There's a lower bound on the potential energy. In that case, exponential minus beta v is always less than exponential minus beta a. Because if v is equal to a, exponential minus beta v equals exponential minus beta a. Otherwise, if v is greater than a, and e to the minus beta v is greater than e to the minus beta a. That is, exponential minus beta a is the largest that e to the minus beta v can be. Okay? So what we're going to do, and I'm simply repeating what's in 1517, is to say, suppose we replace v, the potential energy, with a. We will get an integral that is surely larger than e to the minus beta v because at every point in the integrand, either it's the same or as it was before, or it's bigger. Yes? And if we do that, but we have an advantage, e to the minus beta a is a constant. So the integral becomes trivial. Now we have to ask, how many e to the minus beta a terms are there in there? There's one for each vij. How many Vij's are there? Well, there are n particles, each of which interacts with n minus 1 other particles. So when we write uh, in 15.13 exponential minus beta Vij, when we write that object, um, that's an exponential of a sum is a product of the integrals and the exponent and the product of the integrals e to the integrals is e to the minus beta a how many integrals are there or how many exponentials are there rather n times n minus 1 and thus we reach the extreme right side of equation 15.18 and what 15.18 says is there is an upper bound on the partition function and it is given by exactly what you see there. The part, assuming the potential energy has a lower bound and doesn't go off to minus infinity, the, there is an upper bound on the partition function, which you see there. Okay? Well, that's very nice. But there is one minor feature in a way in which um, that answer is not very satisfying. Suppose you go into that and calculate the Helmholtz free energy of the system. A is minus kT log Q. It's the free energy. And if you take minus kT log Q 15.18, you get 15.19, and you make the interesting observation that A is proportional to capital N squared. That is, the free energy, instead of being an extensive quantity proportional to n, is this quantity that grows as n squared. Now, that's actually quite undesirable because you'd like the free energy, the extensive quantities, to go as n to the first, and then the intensive quantities to be independent of n. How do we fix this? The answer is we introduce something that actually is inserted by Gibbs. Though he, go, he doesn't talk about it quite the same way because he hasn't gotten close to talking about particles that interact strongly with each other. He does introduce particle interactions in his book once. Uh, however, what we say is we are going to, we, if we have particles interacting with each other and the potential energy is well behaved, we have saturation. That is, each particle interacts with a modest number of neighbors, no more. And therefore, we have n particles, and they don't all interact with n min big n minus one of them. They only interact with, say, six of them. 
Now I'm not going to say 6, I instead say little n. And little n is how many particles the particle of interest actually interacts with. And if we replace n minus 1 in 1518 with little n, we get 15.20. And 15.20 is says that the total potential energy is much larger than or is larger than a much smaller quantity. And if you insert 15.20 in, into uh, what is the total potential energy of the system, you get 15.21, that is for um, particle 1 interacting with all of the other particles, e to the minus beta v is less than e to the minus beta little n a. And you then get to 15.22 and 15.23. And the point of 15.22 and 15.23 is that if you have saturation, each particle only interacting with a few neighbors, you have a well-behaved Helmholtz free energy that goes as a capital N to the first power. Well, you might legitimately worry, is saturation reasonable? Uh, let's take a simple case of saturation of water, at least the hydrogen bonding part. Each water has two hydrogen atoms that can hydrogen bond with two neighbors. Its oxygen has two unattached electron pairs which can hydrogen bond with two other neighbors. A water molecule can form four hydrogen bonds, and that's it at a, some level of approximation. That's saturation. Suppose the potential energy depends as 1 over r to a power. Well, there's a dividing line. The dividing line is between r to the minus 1 or r to the minus 2, and the actual line is at r to the minus 3. Those are short range potential, long range potentials, fall off only as 1 over r or whatever. There are also short range potentials that fall off as, say, 1 over r to the 4th power, or 1 over r to the 6th. Why is there a distinction? And this will be the last thing we discuss. Well, we have a potential energy. It falls off as 1 over r to some power. So let's go out a distance r. We, we discover out here there's a spherical shell of other atoms. The number of atoms in this spherical shell grows as the volume of the spherical shell. It grows as r squared. So the number of atoms out here is growing as r squared. The potential energy is falling off as r to the minus n. As long as n is 4 or 6 or whatever, the product of the two is falling off as 1 over r squared or 1 over r cubed or faster. And the integral, if you just add up all of these spherical shells, converges. Let's take the other extreme, the 1 over r potential. The potential energy falls off as 1 over r. Yes. The number of atoms out here grows as r squared. And therefore, the total interaction of the atom in the middle with the atoms in these shells is growing as r squared over r, or r to the first. The atom in the middle interacts primarily with the atoms at great distances. And the interaction grows as r, with r, and therefore the total interaction energy looks like it should be divergent. Well, this is where screening and electron neutrality come in. If you have taken a solid state course, you will have heard of an Awald sum. Well, an Awald sum is how you handle this issue in solids, where the crystals are nice to sit there and not move. The atoms are nice to sit there and not move. And the Awald sum gives you something convergent, though the reason you should use the particular Awald sum you use is not always made very clear. It's just a trick. But it isn't just a trick, it's very, very sound and profound. Okay.
right in the middle, suppose you have a potential energy that falls off as 1 over r cubed. This is the dividing line. The number of materials, atoms in a shelf grows as r squared. The interaction between the atom and any one of them out here falls off as 1 over r cubed. The product falls off as 1 over r. And when I integrate the potential energy from the origin out to infinity, I get a logarithmic divergence. That's the special case boundary. If the fall off is faster than r cubed, the integral converges. If it's slower than 1 over r cubed, you have a big issue, and right on the line you have a logarithmic divergence. Well, so we have short-range potentials and long-range potentials, and Mother Nature arranges things so that the long-range potential we care about, electrostatics, is well-behaved. And the other potential energies we'll talk about are shorter range. There will be a little discussion of the by screening at one point. However, I see we are out of time, and therefore we, therefore we are done.